Okay, uh, this is our first video during the coronavirus break online session for Physics 1000. Uh, we left off talking about um, orbiting. And so we need to continue that discussion. Um, I'm hoping to finish up chapter four uh, right in this session right now. So you should be able to finish up that homework that has been everybody's consternation because the due date was uh, set, uh, I think the first day we were back from the spring break, which was long before we actually came back, which we're not actually back at all. But anyway, uh, but now that we've, we will be finishing this, we can have a real due date. So I'll put that up on sapling. In the meantime, let's work on orbiting. So <clears throat> we talked about last time, we, we briefly discussed what orbiting said and how Newton described the, the idea of if you shoot a cannon off a mountain and it, you don't shoot it very fast, it'll, it'll go pretty far to the base of the mountain. And if you keep on shooting it faster and faster, at some point you can shoot it fast enough that as it goes forward, the earth will fall away underneath it. And even though the cannonball is perpetually falling, the earth curves away as fast as it falls and so it will never actually hit the earth. It just keeps on falling towards the earth while it moves forward. And in such a scenario, if you could make a cannon shoot it that fast and there was no air friction, uh, neither of which can possibly be true, but, and you found a mountain that tall, which doesn't exist, but if you could do all those things, Newton hypothesized that you could shoot a cannon and it would come around and hit you in the back of the head. And, and this, this is actually a drawing from Newton's work. And uh, this idea is what we do. This is how we put satellites in orbit around the Earth. It's just that it's not, we don't launch them from a tall mountain. We, we, go and way, we take it way up into space and where there is no friction and give it a good push so that it goes forward and it falls just as fast as the Earth curves away from it. And so this is the idea of orbiting, and Newton proposed that, and uh, this is indeed exactly what we do to this day. Um, but what about the law of gravity, and how does that work? And we, we talked about uh, how the, the, what the law of gravity um, does, how it acts on two objects that have mass, and um, we talked about uh, what it is, and that's, the answer is we don't really know. Um, but a lot of that work that Newton did based on gravity was dependent on Kepler. So uh, Kepler was a guy that put together, he, he was the guy that really separated astronomy from astrology. And we talked about that stuff already, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on, on it, but I just want to remind you where we left off. Uh, Kepler was a giant in the world of astronomy and science in general. Um, and in one of my classes, I mentioned he's also, he was also a reformer. So what I mean by that, he, he, was, he was a guy that was saying the Catholic Church had lots of things wrong in his day. And uh, he was trying to push everybody back to scripture, which is where a lot of Europe went. Um, but in his day, Europe wasn't there. And so he spent a lot of his days running uh, just to stay alive. Uh, but in any case, uh, one of the biographers wrote about Kepler after reading his, Kepler's uh, personal uh, uh, documents that he wrote. Uh, this biographer wrote about Kepler and he said, based on the documents that he read, uh, he said that Kepler reasoned that because the universe was designed by an intelligent creator, it should function according to some logical pattern. To him, the idea of a chaotic universe was inconsistent with God's wisdom. And this idea here is, uh, is indeed what Kepler was promoting. And, and this is indeed why he did science. He was looking for order. He assumed there was order to be found because he assumed that God made it. And God is a orderly God, therefore, what he made would also be orderly and would point to his, the glory of God. And so Kepler literally devoted his life. We talked about this last time, how he would not sleep uh, at night, but instead sleep during the day so that he could stay up all night, so he could study the stars and see where they went and measure their paths. And um, 
And based on those measurements, which took decades upon decades of hard, laborious work, and the math behind it was very complicated, and, uh, and Kepler reasoned through it all, and out of that, he came up with three laws. Um, and, and I pointed out that the reason that he was looking for order is because he assumed God made it. And he got those ideas straight out of Scripture. Here's one verse that points to this. Uh, this is Psalm 19, verse 4. Um, I'm sorry, verses, uh, the, the first verse, the first part of the psalm there. Uh, King David, he wrote, the, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of His hands. This is just the first verse of that psalm. It's a beautiful psalm. You should check it out. But this declares that God has made everything in not just order, but beautiful order. Order that is good, order that is necessary for life. Let me point out just as a side note, if Kepler had not begun with this assumption, he would have had no reason to look for order. If he assumed everything was the result of an explosion, he would have no reason to look for order. Try it. Take a grenade, throw it in your room, let it see what happens. Does order result? He would have not, if he had assumed that, he would have had no reason to look for order. But he had reason to look for order, so he did look for order, and he found Kepler's three laws. By the way, it's that fundamental reason why all the founders of science, as we know it today, found order. Because they came at it from the Christian worldview, looking for order, because God told them there's order to be found. Straight out of Scripture. I... Uh, so let's look at those laws, Kepler's three laws. Uh, the first one, we talked about it, it's an ellipse and how an ellipse is made with, uh, you can do it with thumbtacks and a string. And since you're at home now, you should try this. You should, you should tick, stick two thumbtacks in a, in a piece of wood or in a, <laughs> on, uh, on a wall, part of maybe a wall behind a door so it doesn't, it doesn't stand out too obvious. But something where you can stick thumbtacks th thumbtack, thumbtack in and tie a loop of string around them that's kind of loose and then put a pen and pull the string tight and just keep it tight all the way around and it will trace out a perfect ellipse. It's, it's really fun to do. Um, and, and, but his first law was that all planets travel in an elliptical orbit with the sun at one of the foci. And the foci would be equivalent to these thumbtacks. The thumbtacks are at, it's a mathematical term. It's not the same as the center. Uh, it's the foci. And uh, the sun is at one of the foci and there's nothing at the other foci. Our gut says there should be, but reality is there just isn't. And, and uh, Kepler pointed that out. Based on his observations, he said, this is what happens. And, and let me just point out that the math behind an ellipse is complicated. And Kepler figured that out based on just two angles and a time for every star over decades of, of, of observations. Uh, his second law was, and this is the complicated one, was that equal areas are swept out in equal times. So in other words, um, as a planet goes around the sun, the sun is at one of the foci, the time here from, from this point to this point along this path is the same as the time from this point to this point, which is the same as the time from this point to this point. And, and Kepler noticed those times and then he traced it out on the ellipse and he found that the area of this piece of the pizza pie and the area of this piece of the pizza pie and the area of this piece of the pizza pie are all the same. In other words, if the area of the ellipse traced by that um, triangle or that piece of the pizza pie are equal, then the times are also equal. And this too is counterintuitive. But the reason this works is because planets travel much faster over here. When they're close to the sun, they, they move very fast. And then when they get over here, they go very slow. And so this distance here is much less than this distance here but the area traced out from the foci, straight lines out to this, and then tracing that arc, that, those areas are the same. So that's the second law. 
The third law that he came up with is, uh, you can say it with words or you can say it with this nice little equation, is that a planet's orbital period squared is proportional to this mean distance from the sun cubed. Now let me specify what mean distance from the sun means. Uh, you see how when you're over here you're a long ways away from the sun, but when you're over here you're really close to the sun. So the, the distance is not the same as you go around the orbit. But if you average those out, that's the mean, the mean distance from the sun. If you average all those out, then you'll get um, the mean distance. And so that's this third law, that mean distance cubed. There's a, notice this is kind of weird, again, not intuitive, but this is just what his observations found. And he just observed it, he measured it, and he calculated it out and found it uh, to be true always. And so the period squared, and the period, just to remind you, is the time that it takes for the planet to go around once. For the Earth, the period of the Earth as it orbits the Sun, you already know this is one year, 365.244 days. Um, so there you go. These are Kepler's three laws. Now let me remind you back up to the story. He spent decades of his life looking for order. He assumed God made it. He assumed that there should be order to be found. After decades of work, he found, shocker of shockers, order. Not just any order, beautiful order, nice concise equations nicely concise. We can say these things with just simple sentences and it's, it's beautiful. And his conclusion, when he got done with all of that, when he put this together in a book, uh, the book was called The Harmony of the Worlds, which is referring to, in poetic language, that the, the worlds, when he's looking at these planets and the stars and their, their, their path in the skies, he's saying it's, it's harmonious, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's not just orderly, it is orderly, but it's more than that. It's, it's astoundingly beautiful. And so the title of his book that really laid the foundation for the separation of astrology and astronomy. Remember, astrology is the witchcraft, and astronomy is the study of the planets and the study of the stars and all the things that we can find in the heavens. And he separated that out, and he called that book where he separated out the harmony of the worlds. And in that book, this is what he said. This says, he said, we see how God, like a human architect, approached the founding of the world according to order and rule, and measured everything in just such a manner. It's, it's extremely orderly. It's extremely perfect. It's, it's like a big giant clock out there. And, and he, he made it in just such a way that's just harmonious and beautiful. And then he concluded by quoting scripture, he said, great is, our, is God our Lord, great is his power, and there is no end to his wisdom. Those are direct quotes from Kepler, and uh, one of the great scientists that founded all of science as we know it today. So we're done with the orbiting section now, and let me uh, throw out a question. It's, it's, it's kind of sad because uh, I can't get you to talk in groups and figure out how to do this, but I'll put the question up here all the same. Here's the question. Uh, our moon travels in a, and then here's multiple choices here, in a circular orbit with the sun at its center, a circular orbit with the earth at its focus, an elliptical orbit with the sun at its center, an elliptical orbit with the earth at one of its foci, or option E, an elliptical orbit with the sun as one of its foci. Well, at this point, you should pause the video, ponder it for a few minutes, talk about it with your mom because you're at home, and, and uh, just think about it for a minute, and then come back. Okay, now that you're back, <clears throat> here's the answer. What does the moon go around? It doesn't go around the sun. It goes around the earth. But Kepler's law says that all planets travel in an ellipse. So the moon 
it's not a planet, it's a moon, but all the same, it's a big ball of rock that's out there orbiting something, is in orbit, so it has to obey Kepler's law. So it's going to orbit in an ellipse. So all these answers that have circle, circular here, circular here, those two are wrong. It does not go in a circle, it goes in an ellipse. According to Kepler's first law, it must go in an ellipse. So it's one of these three, okay? So it's, it's an elliptical orbit. Now, because it's an ellipse, what does it orbit around? Well, it orbits around two foci, specifically one object at one of the foci. So the one of these that says an elliptical orbit with blah, 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 at the center, that's wrong. That's mathematically wrong. We don't care about the center of an ellipse. You care about the foci of an ellipse. So even if, there, even if it did orbit around the sun, the sun would not be at the center. So e, uh, C is wrong. Okay, so that leaves us with D and E. So it travels in an elliptical orbit, and it goes around the Earth. So the Earth is at one of its foci. So the answer is uh, D. D, uh, the elliptical orbit with the Earth at, as one of its foci. It does not go around the sun. It goes around the Earth. Now, okay, so we'll, we'll leave it at that. I hope that makes sense. If you have questions about that, send me an email and, uh, or bring it up in the study session. I think we've got a study session coming up on, on Thursday. So, uh, moving on to the next section in chapter four. The next section talks about the upper limit of speed. Remember this section is all about rockets and, and how do they work and, and all that stuff. And <clears throat> remember they work by a constant explosion. It's a conservation of momentum problem and we worked through all that stuff. And so we're talking about rockets and the question is what's the upper limit? How fast can rockets possibly go? And there's two major factors that limit rockets. The first one is the very obvious and simple one, fuel. Remember how they work? They work by literally squirting fuel out the back and blowing it up just to make it go fast. And so they, when you run out of fuel, you're dead, you're done. You can't go anywhere else. You, you will have accomplished some speed and you'll keep coasting in that direction, but you, you can't make yourself go faster. So the biggest limitation and of our two factors here, uh, this is where we are as a society. We, uh, our rockets are limited by fuel. The, the, as fast as they can go is limited by how much fuel we are capable of making them carry. It's hard to make them carry enough fuel to get the job done. So that's, this is one of the big challenges that engineers are working on. We can figure out how to do it to get to Mars, but the longer they can burn fuel, the faster they can get there. And so uh, we'd like our astronauts to not have to grow old on the journey to Mars. We'd like them to get there in a reasonable time period. So we want to give them as much fuel as they can to get there. And so this is, a, this is always one of the challenges that engineers face when they're working on rockets. But there's a second factor. The second factor is, is a more um, fundamental factor that uh, we can't overcome. Even if we can overcome this one, we can't overcome this one. There is a universal speed limit. And by universal, I mean everywhere in the universe. It doesn't matter. You can't go faster than this. And what is that speed limit? <laughs> well, I'll show you. <clears throat> It's that equation. <laughs> and you say, what? What is that equation? Here's what this means. Okay. <sighs> Momentum. Now, we already talked about this. I'm going to put it up on the board here for you. Momentum is mass times velocity. And we talked about this a few chapters ago. Momentum is mass times velocity. And then we worked through this and we figured out this is how rockets work and, and we got this equation down. We understand it. We, we dealt with um, ice skaters colliding into each other and angular momentum as they spin around and make themselves spin faster and, and all versions of momentum. We've talked about this quite a bit. Momentum is mass times velocity. But here's the thing. This equation, uh, that, that Newton used is actually a little bit askew. 
it's missing a piece. Newton didn't realize this. Most people didn't realize this until uh, <laughs> Einstein came along. When Einstein came along, he realized, you know what? There's a piece missing, and it's this piece down here. You see, we have the same equation, ma momentum equals mass times velocity. It's the same equation up top, but there's this new piece down here at the bottom. And that's Einstein's addition to this. And, and this piece, let's just talk about this for a minute. Um, let me just show you. The speed of light, is that a big number or a small number? Is the speed of light fast or is the speed of light slow? Well, light travels very, very, very fast. It's a very, very big number. Let me show it to you, what the speed of light is. The, um, the speed of light is 2.99 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. What does that mean? Well, let me just write it out. Two, and now it'll, I'll get rid of the scientific notation and the decimal point just so you can see this in normal number format. Uh, I have to count this out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's a thousand, a thousand, there we go. 299 million meters per second. That's how fast the speed of light is. It's very fast. Okay, the speed of light is very fast. <clears throat> in fact, for a long time, people thought it was instantaneous. It seems that way to the naked eye. They couldn't even, they tried hard to measure how fast the speed of light is. And for a long time, we just couldn't measure any speed. It just seemed to be instantaneous. You turn the light switch on and boom, it's light on the other side of the room almost immediately. It seems immediate. So it must be, there must be infinite speed. It must just go as fast as it, faster than anything we know of. And so it is faster than anything we know of. Um, eventually we were able to measure the speed and we realized that there is a speed to it. it it's just a very fast speed. And uh, so now with this in mind, let's go back to this equation for a second, okay? So now let's say you're a rocket and you're going real fast. Let's say you're going, I don't know, 5,000 meters per second. I mean, that's, that's cooking, right? You're going real fast. That's probably cooking more than anything we can know of. But let's just throw, let's just use that number. Yeah, that's going way too fast. Let me try a different number that's more reasonable. Let's say 800 meters per second. That's a good number. Okay, that's, that's within the realm of reasonable here. We've, we've actually gone that fast. Okay, so 800, that, although that's extremely fast. 800 meters per second, that's your speed. And then you gotta take that and divide that by the speed of light. Now, except you gotta square it. Okay, so let's write this out. <clears throat> 800 squared divided by the speed of light, 299123123, and this is also squared. Now, 800 squared, that's a big number. But this number squared, is an even bigger number. So when you square this out, what are you going to get? Well, let's, let me see if I can do this math in my head. I didn't bring my calculator with me. That wasn't smart. Um, let's see. Uh, 8 squared is 64, but then I'm going to have to put four zeros on it. So it's going to be 6, 4 with four zeros on it. Okay. And then I'll just round this off to 3. So that's 9. But then I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, can you just double it again? Nine with 16 zeros on it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen zeros on it. So these four zeros are going to cancel out these four zeros. <laughs> In any case, you got 64 over a really gigantic number. So is this quotient, you remember this, this division here, this number divided by that number, is that a big number or a small number? That's a very tiny number. Tiny. Now look back over here at this equation, okay? So now we're got, for this equation to work, you've got to do one minus that quotient. Now what's one minus a very tiny number? One. 
right? So notice momentum then becomes mass, divide, mass times velocity divided by 1. <laughs> you see how, I'm, how uh, Newton never noticed it? The vast majority of the time it makes no difference whatsoever. It doesn't impact anything. Only if your speed becomes very fast does this become something. And then you say, okay, I'm beginning to understand this. This is kind of starting to make sense. What does this have to do with anything? How is this a universal speed limit? I'm trying to find universal speed limit, and all you're doing is talking about momentum. I don't get it. A weird momentum at that. Here's what I'm trying to say. What does it take to change your momentum? Remember the impulse equation? Impulse is force times time, which is the change in momentum. The force times time, let me say that again, the force on an object times the time that the force acts on it causes the momentum of the object to change. Okay, now think about this in terms of rockets. You want to go faster. You want to change your momentum. In order to change your momentum, you have to apply a force for a time period. Now, go back over here to this. Let's say you get going real fast, faster than anything we've made, and you get going so that you're almost your speed is almost the speed of light. Well then what's your speed, which is almost the speed of light, divided by the speed of light? And square both those numbers. Oh. Well that would be one. If, if your speed was the same as the speed of light, something divided by itself, anything divided by itself is just one, right? And one squared is just one. And what's one minus one? Zero. And what's the square root of zero? Zero. Now here's where it gets tricky. Check this out. You have mass. You have velocity. And this thing downstairs <laughs> is zero. What's something divided by zero? Oh, that's that pesky little number that nobody likes to talk about. That's infinity. That means your momentum, if you get going real fast, is in infinite. Your momentum is infinite. Okay, so now go back over here. If you want to change your momentum, you have to apply a force times a time, but your momentum is approaching infinity. How much force is it going to take to move that? <laughs> An infinite force. And that's why there's a universal speed limit. Because in order to go faster than the speed of light, your momentum would be infinite, and you'd have to apply an infinite force to change it. And that can't be done. Therefore, the speed of light is the universal speed limit. Whew. I hope that makes sense. There's a lot there. It's complicated. It's tricky. Let, let, me, let me step through it. Let's do an example. Hopefully this will help. Okay, so let me clear off some board space here. And while I'm clearing the board space, you can read the example. <clears throat> so if you and your mass is 55 kilograms while you're floating in space, I don't know why you're floating in space. That doesn't sound like a very good idea to me. But anyway, you are. You're floating off in space, and you decide to change your speed from 15 meters per second, not too fast, to some new speed, a second speed, speed number two. And you're not going to take, you've got, you got time. You're just floating in space anyway. You've got time to do this. You're going to spend four days doing it. Okay? So you're going to spend four days changing your speed from 15, a very small number, to whatever V2 is, and it's going to take you four days. And the question is, how much force, what would be the average required force when V2, and there's four different options here. Now, 
at this point, I would split the class up into four groups and I'd have each group figure out how to do this. But we're not in class. It's just you sitting there watching this video. You and YouTube. So here's what I suggest you do. I'm going to show you how to do these. And then I suggest you break out your calculator and try all four of these. Okay? Because you need practice doing this. You have to be able to do this stuff on the test. Coming up real soon, by the way. So you better figure out how to do this. You better figure out how to punch this out on your calculator. You better figure out how to get these answers. Okay? So let's step through this. Um, let's actually do question B first. Okay? It's, just, it's one of the... Actually, you know what? Let's do D first. I should have done that. should have written these out in opposite order. Let's do question D first. This will be the easiest one. Okay? Let's do the easy one first. Okay? So, so here's what we have to do. There's your mass. There's your initial speed. There's your time. And right here, that's your second speed. So let me write that up here on the board. Remember how do you solve problem? The problem solving strategy is write down what you know and what you need to know. Okay? So we know that your mass is 55 kilograms. We know that your initial speed, your first speed, is 15 meters per second. We know when we're doing part D, so we know that your second speed is 290. I thought I fixed this. Oh, I did. I fixed it on the next slide. Um, change these numbers in your notes. Um, I meant to change this before class started, but I forgot. I fixed, I fixed it on the next slide, but I forgot it on this slide. Change all these to um, 200. All these 299s, change them to 298s, okay? Fix your notes. Um, they're all, they all should be 298s, okay? So let me write that up here. 298,000 meters per second. And the, oh, and the time, we're given the time, that's four days. And we're asked for force, okay? Here's what we know and what we need to know. Now, that one right there, not standard units. We better fix it. Okay, so let's see. Four days, that's going to be, uh, how many, we need, to, we need seconds, right? Those are standard units for time, seconds. So uh, what do we know? Oh, we know hours in a day, right? How many hours in a day? Oh, there's 24 of those. So in one day, there's 24 hours. So days cancel out. And now, that's still not seconds yet, how many minutes are in an hour? Let's see, in one hour, notice I put that downstairs so it would cancel out up here. In one hour, there's 60 minutes. So hours cancel out there. Well, now we've got minutes, but we need seconds, so we can make this step now. In one minute, there's 60 seconds, so minutes cancel out. Okay, so now you multiply by 4, multiply 4 by 24 by 60 by 60. Multiply all the way across there, and that'll give you the number seconds in 4 days. And like I said, I already forgot my calculator, so I'll have to let you punch that out. Okay, so now the question is, how are we going to find that force? And you may have guessed, because we just talked about it a few minutes ago, that we're going to use the impulse equation here. So the impulse... Remember what it is, is force times time. And what it does is change your momentum. So it's mass times velocity 2 minus mass times velocity 1. Remember that word change, that triangle, means final minus initial. So this is final momentum, this is initial momentum. Okay? So to solve this for force, we're just going to use this side and this side and divide both sides by T. So just a little bit of algebra here, not too much. Divide by T, so the T's are going to cancel out over here. So the equation we need is force is equal to M times V2 minus M times V1 over the time. Okay, and we can simplify this ever so slightly. See that there's an M here? 
and an M here. Let's make our life easy. Pull that out of there. So we get M times V2 minus V1 divided by time. Okay, there we go. That's the equation we need to solve this problem. So we just plug in our stuff. Let's see, M, I'm sorry, force is gonna be equal to mass, which was 15, times V2 minus V1. Oh wait, what was V2? Uh, V2 was 298,000, and V1 was 15, and the time was whatever you figured out here. It's a big number. Okay. There we go. That's how you do part D. There you go, that's not so bad, right? You can punch all those numbers out. Okay, now, while we're at, while we're at this, um, let me just go ahead and say, that's also how you're gonna do B. The only difference is, is your, your second speed, your final speed, will be a thousand times bigger. Notice this 298 with six zeros after it, that's just shy of the speed of light. Okay, now we're, for parts B and D, the whole point here is don't consider relativity. And when I say don't consider relativity, I mean momentum is just MV. If you're to consider relativity, you have to have that big square root thing in the bottom. That part that Einstein added, that's relativity. That's making this a relativistic problem. Okay, so uh, that's how you would do parts B and D. And I'm gonna pause the video right here so I can run and go get my calculator. And uh, that will give you a chance to make the, the calculations, use this equation for part D and use this equation for part B. And then I'll come back and we'll, I'll show you how to do parts A and C and I'll have my calculator with me too. So uh, let's pause it here and I'll see you in a minute. Okay, so I've got my calculator going. I actually just am gonna use the calculator on my computer. Uh, so the number of seconds, four days in terms of seconds is this number here. It's a, it's a pretty big number. I'm sure that you already punched it out by now. And so that's the time that needs to go downstairs here. And uh, I'll let you punch that out. Um, I'm not gonna do that one for you just yet. I will show you in a couple minutes, but you should punch it out and figure that out. Okay, so now you've got the method to do parts B and D of this, and you should have already punched those out and come up with answers. And now let's talk about how to do parts A and C. Let's do part C first, okay? So um, so we're still gonna start with the impulse equation. Force times time is equal to change in momentum. The only difference is momentum for parts A and C, we have to consider relativity. We have to consider that little square root piece in the, in the denominator. So our change in momentum equation is gonna look different. It's still gonna be momentum final minus momentum initial, initial because that's what that triangle means. The triangle means change and we can't undo that. That's, that's part of the equation. So we have to rewrite this like this. We have to say, uh, <clears throat> Mass times velocity two, that's final, but now we gotta include that square root part. So we're gonna have downstairs the square root of one minus V2 over the speed of light squared, squared. And then, so that's final momentum. Now we gotta do the same thing for initial momentum. So it's gonna be mass times V1 divided by the square root of one minus V1 squared over the speed of light squared. Okay, so let's punch this out. Now, also, if we wanna find force, we still have to get F by itself. So we still have to divide both sides by T. So uh, we're gonna divide this by T and it's gonna cancel out over there, but whatever you do to one side, you have to do the other, so we're gonna put the T downstairs over there, and uh, there you go, that's what we're gonna do. Okay, so 
Um, let's work this out. So let me write this out a little bit more concisely. There's not much, this is just plain ugly. You can't really make this a whole lot prettier. But let me show you two pieces that we can do. Rather than having this, I mean, this is already a rough improper fraction. We're gonna, but this downstairs just makes it even uglier. I'm gonna pull an M out of this and put that out front with a T downstairs so that we have M over T times V2 divided by the square root of one minus V2 squared over V light squared minus V1 divided by the square root of one minus V1 squared over V light squared end square bracket. Okay, so that's the equation we're going to work with. Whew. That's kind of ugly, isn't it? So here's what I would suggest. Let's see, mass, that's 50, 55, right? So let me write this out. This is going to be 55 divided by the time, that's this big number here, 3, 4, 5, 600. Okay, so here's, that's just this piece here, this mass over time, that's this. I would suggest you punch that in your calculator right now and then store it in the letter A, if you're using one of the TI-80 whatevers. Um, the STO button on the, on the left hand side there, use the STO button, and then alpha A. So store this in A, okay? And now we'll keep writing this out. Um, V2, and then we're doing part C here, so V2 is 298 with three zeros after it, divided by the square root of one minus, 298 with three zeros after it squared divided by 2.99 times 10 to the eighth squared. Okay, so here's what I would do. Here's how, oh wait, wait let me finish writing this out. Minus uh, V1, which was 15, divided by the square root of one minus 15 squared over 2.99 times 10 to the eighth squared, end square bracket. Okay, now you have to punch all that into your calculator. <laughs> That's a trick, isn't it? Okay, so let me show you. I already told you about this part. You're gonna store that part in A, okay? Now, let's do this one right here, okay? Just this piece. Do this in steps, okay? So now, uh, start with 15. Type out 15 on your calculator. Hit the square button. So now you've got 15 squared. I think that's 225, okay? And then hit divide. So you're gonna do divide by. And now do a parenthesis. And type in 2.99. And then hit the EE -E button. You have to push the second uh, depending on which calculator you have, it's usually a, a yellow button, but the second EE, -E, you push that and that EE -E means times 10 to. And then you type the letter, hit the number eight. Okay, so you have 225 divided by uh, 2.99 and your calculator says E8. And then you end your parentheses and now you hit square. Now hit enter. And you should have a very small number right now. Very, very, very small. Now do one minus, now don't type this again, one minus second answer. Okay, this is, the answer is ANS, it's on the very bottom of your calculator, it's, it's just above, uh, I believe it's above the equal sign. Okay, so you're gonna do one minus all that. And now uh, that will give you, I, I think the TI-80 whatever will actually just tell you it's the number one, which is okay, just let it stay like that. And now hit square root of that and now do 15 divided by that. Okay, so let me type this out on the board over here. Let me show you how, what you get here. Okay, we're gonna have 15 divided by 
the square root of 1 minus 15 squared divided by 2.99 times 10 to the power of 8. The whole thing squared. And lo and behold, what do you get but 15. Okay? So now that you've done all that, and I showed, I've shown you how to do this piece. Now once you, once you have that saved, now store that in your calculator as C. Okay? So store it in your calculator as C. Now do this one here. Do the same thing. Punch it out. It'll be slightly different numbers. Store that in your calculator and you'll get B. Okay? Now when you do that, now you can just type it out in your calculator. You have A stored, you'll have B stored, and you'll have C stored. And now you can just type out A times parentheses B minus C and parentheses and it'll spit out the answer. Okay? So now I've shown you how to do C and I've shown you how to do well I've shown you how to do two out of the four of these, okay? So uh, you can now finish going through on your own doing A uh, and B. I've done C and D for you, showing you how to do it. Now you can do A and B. And it's going to take some time. It's okay. Just This is practice for you getting ready to do your test. So go ahead and spend some time doing that. And uh, hit the pause button on the computer right now and spend some time punching those bu buttons. And when you get it figured out, unpause it and we'll keep going. Okay? So now that you spent time doing, crunching all those numbers, I know it took a while, uh, here's what you've got. These are the answers. This one, the force is 47.5 Newtons. So in order for you to get going that fast, 298,000 meters per second, that's really fast by the way, if you can get, it, all you gotta do is push yourself with 47 Newtons for, to, for four days straight, but you know, if you can do that, you can get going that fast. Hey, that's pretty good. That's if you don't consider relativity. Now what happens if you do consider relativity? If you do consider relativity, <laughs> hey look, you get almost the same thing. In fact, I think I mistyped that. I think it is exactly the same thing. But here's my point. Even if it's not exactly the same thing, I think it is. Uh, I think that's just a typo. Relativity is not a factor when things aren't going really, really fast. This is fast, don't get me wrong, but it's not fast enough for relativity to be significant. Now, here's my point. Relativity is real. It is reality. It has to be considered. The, the, the GPS system in your car has relativity built into it. The satellites that are traveling up above the Earth, they're far enough away and moving fast enough around the Earth that they have to take that into their calculations when telling you where you are. If they didn't take that into account, they would be wrong. So relativity is real and it does work, but the vast majority of the time, there's no difference. It doesn't change things. Now, when we get up here and we start crunching these numbers, that's when we start getting different answers. When you consider this one, if you don't consider relativity, if you want to get going that fast, just shy of the speed of light, well, you only have to pu push yourself with 47,000 Newtons. Well, it's just a thousand more than that one. Okay. Yeah, that's, but that's not reality. If that's all, by the way, that's all Newton knew. He didn't know about this part that Einstein added. And, and, and Newton, he was almost right. He just didn't quite have that little piece because nothing he dealt with ever went anywhere close to that fast. For that matter, we don't have much today that goes that fast. But let me show you what happens if we consider that same problem with relativity. How much force would it take? <sighs> A lot more. A lot more force. That means you'd have to push yourself with 580,000 
349 newtons of, of force for four days straight. By the way, just in case you're wondering, that's 65 and a half tons of force pushing you for four days straight. Now, don't get me wrong, the Saturn V, we looked at the movie about that, the big rocket that took us to the moon, the Saturn V could push that hard. But not for four days. It could push that hard for a couple minutes. Do you see what I'm saying here? Four days is a long time, and pushing that hard for four days is not reasonable. We can't do that. Okay, so just to put this in perspective, where are we in terms of reality? So let me show you a few slides here. What are the, some of the fastest things that we know of? Okay, the fastest human we know uh, is Mr. Usain. Usain Bolt, they call him. That's his name. But that's because he's the fastest human. I mean, he's, his name is Bolt, but he is, he's just faster than everybody. There he is in, in the Olympics, and he's out running the second place guy. He was, he's from Jamaica. He's from the United States. Third place was also from Jamaica. And, uh, and there you go. He, he set the land speed record for the fastest person could run, and he ran an average speed of 23.4 uh, miles per hour, which is 10.4 meters per second. Just in case you're wondering in terms of the speed of sound, that's Mach 0.03. <laughs> in terms of the speed of sound, remember Mach 1 is the speed of sound, so he's going three hundredths of the speed of sound. And that, now by the way, just as a side note, just to let you know, this guy is fast, okay? That's the average speed over the hundred yard dash. <laughs> average speed. He started at zero. Right, it's a dead stop. He was clocked with a radar gun as hitting a high speed of 28 at the midway point. So he was going 28 miles an hour. So that's, there it is, that's the fastest anybody's ever gone. Running with their own two feet, 28 miles an hour. Okay, well, uh, you not have to get, Usain Bolt does not have to worry about relativity. Okay, let's step it up a notch, okay? The fastest airplane we've, human beings have ever made is this thing. This is the coolest airplane ever. This is called the SR-71 Blackbird. Uh, it's a titanium skinned airplane. It's super fast. It can fly super high. Uh, it was used in the Cold War as a reconnaissance airplane. It never had any bombs or guns. It, we don't, we've retired it. It's just too expensive to run. No, we don't use these things anymore. But it w as it was flying over the Soviet Union, taking pictures, the Soviets knew about it, but they couldn't do anything about it because they couldn't shoot it down. This went faster than the Soviets' missiles. Anytime they see it, they shoot a missile at it, and the missile would miss because the missile couldn't catch it. This is the fastest airplane we've ever, that anybody's ever made. And it was clocked. The speed that they would share with the public, there's a lot of conspiracy theory folks who think it could go, actually go faster than this, but we'll never know because they've retired the thing, <laughs> or at least they say. Anyway, uh, it was clocked at uh, 2,193 2 miles per hour. That's 980 meters per second. Just in case you're wondering, in terms of the speed of sound, that's Mach 3. Three times the speed of sound, fastest airplane in the world. Actually, the coolest airplane also. That's just another side note. But anyway, there you go. Uh, world's fastest airplane. But you know what? That's only 2,000. No. Relativity does not have to be considered when dealing with the SR-71 Blackbird. Okay, well, what's faster than that? Well, the fastest ob manned craft ever made, you guessed it, the Saturn V. I've, we've already watched the video on it. I'm telling you, this thing was amazing. And that's retired too. But anyway, the fastest time the Saturn V ever got going was on the Apollo 10 mission. And there's the crew of the Apollo 10. They also didn't land on the moon. It was Apollo 11 was the first to land on the moon. So the 10th mission was just to see, again, can we repeat this? Can we get to the moon again? 
and they did. They went to the moon and turned around, did a couple orbits around the moon and came back. And on the way to the moon, they said, you know what, let's just see what this thing can do. And they gave it full gas on the way to the moon. And they got up to 24,790 miles per hour. Nobody's ever gone that fast since. This was in the 60s. In meters per second, that's 11,082 meters per second. In terms of the speed of sound, that's Mach 32. That's insane. Now, there is no sound there, so we don't have to worry about it because sound requires air to travel through, and in space there's no air, therefore there's no sound, so it's not really a problem, but all the same, they're going Mach 32 on the way to the moon. That's pretty impressive. Still not close enough for relativity to be a factor. Well, okay, that's the fastest manned aircraft. What's the fastest thing of all? The fastest thing ever was the Juno mission that we did in 2013. We sent a satellite to Jupiter. And to get to Jupiter, we launched this satellite off of Earth we launched it over here on August 15th of 2011. The Earth went around the Sun three times, and, by the, and in that time, as the Earth went around three times, by October 9th of 2013, the Earth was over here. In that time, our Juno satellite went way out here, outside of our own orbit, and then circled back around, and then used the Earth's gravity to pull it and to slingshot it, to make it go faster. So it's being pulled by the Earth as it's chasing the Earth. The Earth's gravity is pulling it, and it's getting going faster and faster and faster, and it's cruising, and by the time it caught up to the Earth, it was going super fast, and it screamed past the Earth and used that high speed to launch it way out here to just hit Jupiter, and then it orbited itself around Jupiter and took a whole bunch of data. It was a really cool mission. By the way, the math behind all that is insane, and it's all... Kepler's equations. NASA's still using it. It works. But anyway, as it flew by planet Earth on October 10th, 2013, it was going 90,000 miles per hour, <laughs> or 40,234 meters per second. And just in case you're wondering, that's Mach 121. <laughs> 121 times the speed of sound. Surely we have to consider relativity with that kind of speed. And just in case you're wondering, a 50 caliber bullet is not anywhere close as fast as this. This is 50 times faster than a 50 caliber bullet. I'm sorry, a, a .5 caliber bullet. This thing, this is fast fastest object ever, way faster than any bullets or rockets or anything like that. So where does this fit? Well, let me show you. Here's a graph. The red line is if Newton was right, which he wasn't. The force it would take to make you go faster if that final speed for that equation that we did over here earlier on the board, if that final speed was these various different numbers, Newton's idea was it would just take a little bit more force for each a little bit faster. And you could easily go the speed of light right over here. You just, a little bit more force, it'll get there. But the problem is Einstein figured out that it just doesn't work. And as you get closer and closer and closer to the speed of light, the amount of force that it takes to, send, to get you to go faster becomes infinite. And you're never gonna get to the speed, it goes straight up before you get to speed of light. You'll never get there. Okay, so where do these objects fall on this graph? Well, Usain Bolt is right there. And the Juno mission? It's right there. That's as fast as we can go. Fuel is our biggest issue right now, not the universal speed limit. But all the same, it is real and we do have to consider it. Okay, so there you go. We're now finished with chapter four. Woohoo! You can now finish the homework set that's been posted since before spring break. I'll set the due date right, and you can have that set ready to go. Have a good weekend, or have a good day. It's not weekend yet. We're still a long ways away. <laughs>